Hey y'all, Scott here. Go greet a season. It's the busiest Christmas Eve of the year for us over here at the left pole. Uh, Santa's got the north covered, we got the left. I formed this company when I noticed that Santa Claus was the only supplier of holiday cheer. If I wanted it from anybody else, I'd have to convert religions. It's a monopoly, and if you disagree, well, I don't. Competition helps everybody, especially self-esteem. Santa's been cruising on elf labor and white hair for the past 2,000 years, and it's all because nobody's stood up to him to tell him to do better. So, we have four hours to finish and deliver gifts to every person on Earth. Ever? I don't think Santa does the dead one, so that's a good market to reach. We can't travel the world by ourselves. That's a nine deer job. Put me in a room with nine deer and tell us to do a job. I'll finish top five. We've only finished two presents so far, and one's an IOU. Okay, well, if it comes down to it, the pack of cigarettes, we can separate amongst 20 people. I just don't see how we compete with Santa. We don't have anything to combat him. We don't have silver bullets. We don't have garbage. Well, we're just gonna have to learn everything Christmas. We're gonna have to do everything he does. I'm going as fast as I can! Jerry, how's our biblical research going? I just got to the part about cannibalism. Oh, my bad. Inbreeding. Uh, Target employee, have you opened the door yet for us to walk outside? Ah, uh, yeah, my hands are pooped. Well. Does anybody have any spare ups to give? I gave those up long ago. Who am I kidding? We're never gonna be able to compete with Santa. We'll never be not real like he is. Now, now, I think we're gonna have a shot. We just gotta stop making these presents by hand. There's gotta be something lying around here that can suffice as a gift. What about this? No, I need that. It helps remind me there's a dead rat on the floor I need to clean up. Okay, what about all those games in the shopping cart? Oh yeah. Why do you have all these games here? I was gonna return them. Why are they in a shopping cart? I was gonna return that too. You hoard games all the time. Why do you wanna get rid of these? Well, one of them has blood on it. And this one's got shit on it. Wait, no it doesn't. Yeah, it does. Well then why are you returning it then? I need answers. And I'm not getting it from here. You really wanna know? It all started. Well, I can go as far back as the birth of Satan, but I'll fast forward to 1983. The video game industry was in a tough spot after the boom of arcades and home video game consoles. Many companies said, hey, that's a great idea. Let's do that too. Two, 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 two. Oversaturation. There was no quality control. Everybody was making video games because for consoles like the Atari 2600, there was no procedure to get a game approved for release on the system. You could just release a game for the system. Because of this, retailers didn't know what games were the ones they wanted to keep in stock. Consumers were getting burned by bad quality titles and the industry entered the infamous crash of 1983, all because everybody thought they could open a video game company this year. Introducing Data Design Systems. Who are they? Bad. But at the time, they were just like any other small software developer based out of the UK. They would go on to craft gaming experiences, mostly for home computers, such as the Commodore 64, Amstrad CPC, and ZX Spectrum, the games such as Tobruk the Clash of Armor, DNA Warrior, and Annals of Rome. <laughs> But by the time 1990 rolled around, Data Design Systems was no more. Acquired by Stuart Green's company, Green Solutions, the studio was renamed to one Data Design Interactive. Does that name ring a bell? Well, or maybe these images will refresh your memory. Hmm? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that Data Design Interactive. Well, throughout the 1990s, they developed numerous titles of a lower quality. It wasn't until the mid-2000s hit with the introduction of the Nintendo Wii that they finally rose to infamy. From 2004 to 2009, they created over 30 titles, more than half of their entire resume of games released since 1983. While Data Design was pretty much always a developer of lesser titles, they pushed that perception to its limit in the Wii era. And the crazy thing is, they benefited from it. The quantity over quality initiative they were focusing on actually succeeded. They were doing well during this time because of the casual consumer base of the Wii picking up their games just because of the low price not knowing any better. They opened a US office, secured licenses for well-known brands, and boasted 40% market share of all value-priced Wii games in Europe, all because they won people over with cheap prices and enticing box art. <laughs> I can't say I wouldn't. Thankfully, this business strategy did not work in the long run, as just a few years later, in 2009, 
Trading ceased at the company, and it later went fully defunct in 2012. Satan speed, Data Design. During my numerous shovelware benders, I've already experienced many of Data Design's most infamous titles. I don't want to look at them anymore. They remind me of bad. Well, regardless of the quality, they are pretty multi-purpose. Like, I could use this as a rectangle. So it's settled! We'll use these as Christmas presents! Well, you know what they say. Sure. No, they don't. They say yes! And so do I. All right. We're in a product testing zone. If we're gonna distribute these, we gotta do product testing. We can't do that, we don't have time. Do we really wanna risk the lives and safety of children everywhere? Do we not wanna meet our deadline? You know what, fine. The only way you can truly defeat a demon is by taking a look at its entire life and understanding fully why it is the way it is. And the sooner we get that out of the way, the sooner I can get out of here and achieve glory. Well, let's test out the worst game developer of all time's entire catalog of games and see if we actually gain anything from that. Oh my god, is that a lump? We already have. First off, you know how the old saying goes, one of Data Design's first major releases was Tobruk, The Clash of Armor in 1987. They did a couple of incredibly obscure independent ZX Spectrum releases beforehand alongside some actual professional software, but I'm only talking the real stuff, you know, the stuff that can make me cry. Released exclusively in the UK for personal computers at the time, Tobruk, The Clash of Armor was a bit of a revelation for everybody. Evil is born. You're telling me this was the first thing they made? What was their MO? Was Smirnoff funding them? Tobruk is a turn-based strategy game from the 80s. You know what that means. <laughs> Not only does this age poorly, I don't think this game in particular was ever at the top of the food chain. I can't really say this is abhorrent. I mean, this is a World War II strategy game from 1987. As much as I would love to tell them do better, the wall isn't responding. Afterwards, Data Design mainly created multi-platform versions of pre-existing titles. The ZX Spectrum versions of Annals of Rome and DNA Warrior, the ZX Spectrum and Amstrad CPC versions of Loops. These were all UK only releases, so Thank God, that body of water is really coming in handy. I mean, look at these games. What do you want me to say about them? There's not much to say. Oh man, that's actually pretty good. There's not much to say about these. They're either incredibly bland, simple, and flat out bad budget PC games from the late 80s, early 90s, or they're not nearly as good. But that brings us to Data Design's home console efforts. Here on the second master system, they ported Xenon 2 Mega Blast. How do we know that? Oh, that's how. Jesus Christ, could this run any slower? Yes. Xenon 2 is a perfectly fine shoot 'em up at its core that just so happens to also be painfully slow when anything other than your ship appears on screen. So I wouldn't say it's bad, I'd just say it's unplayable. But hey, Data Design's catalog thus far may not be anything to write home about, but at least it's fairly inoffensive. I mean, how good you hate the developers of Game Boy Jeopardy. Oh. Well, regardless, this may be Data Design's best effort yet, which isn't saying much. It's pretty hard to mess up Jeopardy, especially when this version is heavily based on the NES game developed by Rare, so they had two sources to base this project off of. It'd be more impressive if they f***ed it up. But no, it's just Jeopardy on the go. Same types of questions you normally get during a game. A tree dweller whose name implies one of the seven deadly sins. Keebler. Alphabetically, it's number one. Hey! It lay in the house that Jack built. Jack. The more accurate name for the American Buffalo. North American Buffalo. The herring lake fish often requested off a pizza. Bad fish. Aesop character that won by a hair. Rapunzel. Admirals, this father of the nuclear sub managed to serve 18 years beyond compulsory retirement age. Admiral? Captain Crunch. No, not that, not that cereal mascot. Right, Chocula. And it turns out because Data Design did an adequate enough job with Jeopardy, they got Jeopardy Sports Edition and Wheel of Fortune on Game Boy as well. If you needed a Game Boy or ZX Spectrum version of your game, well, they were guy. They weren't your guy, my guy, no guy. They were just guy. But they must have impressed somebody because they received one of the highest honors a developer can receive, porting a version of James Pond 2 codenamed Robocod. I mean, look at how many versions exist. How could it not be? Now, who's James Pond? All right, well, that question's answered. My apologies if I sound a bit like a Scrooge, but I don't like that f***ing fish. Oh, come on, where's your Christmas spirit? All right, my bad. Let's see what the fish can do. Merry Christmas, Jerry.
Listen, you gotta understand, I, I can't do both of these at the same time. Data Design is responsible for the Commodore 64 and Game Boy versions of the title, the latter being known as Super James Bond over here. God, this is just a sloppy, bare-bones platformer. It just reeks of a game that was on your PC when you were little, and that's why you played it, because it was there. Now, I'll be fair to Data Design, this isn't an issue exclusive to their versions of the game, this is the James Bond 2 wide epidemic. So let's see if they redeem themselves with their very own platform developed wholly by data design, this is Pinky. That isn't Pinky, that's just pink. Wow, a platformer with really bright, colorful, detailed visuals, great music, ho-hum controls, and boring level design? I'm impressed! This was followed by Exit on Amiga, a simple block-pushing puzzle game. Nothing to write home about, but it was fine enough for what it was. But that wasn't enough for data design. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. They couldn't stop it being just mediocre. They had to craft one of the worst video games of all time th that didn't involve a, a, a f***ing fish. Data design is responsible for the SNES, Game Boy, and Sega Mega Drive, that's the Sega Genesis in Europe, versions of Rise of the Robots, an infamous fighting game. One of the most notorious examples of, oh God. Visually, this ain't half bad. It's honestly pretty impressive for the time. The gameplay on the other hand, oh Jesus. This game was intensely hyped up as some kind of good game. It was mostly all about the graphics, but then it came out. And while the visuals were sufficient considering how heavily marketed they were, the gameplay is so basic and in some areas flat out broken. You have three variations of punches and kicks, but they all look the same. There's barely any characters, bland and lifeless environments, and would you believe the SNES version may be one of the better versions of the game? Another case of data design not being entirely at fault here. In fact, they might have been the most competent developer of all of the Rise of the Robots release. Say what you will, but they put full motion cutscenes in the damn Game Gear version, like, come on! The game may be a sloppy, incompetent fighter that's mediocre to mash buttons to at best, but it's like that everywhere, so how much of this is Data Design's fault? Looking at the reviews of the Game Gear version? All of it. Of course, after that, they had to hop back to what they were best at, Jeopardy on Game Boy with Platinum Edition! Several opera scores by this Italian rival of Mozart. Wozart? It's located between EST and MST. The letter X! This is endless, restless, and useless, and it killed the cat. A gun. Appending these four letters to an odor means to execute it at once. What? This round flat bread is the flat basis of tacos, enchiladas, and burritos. Bread after I sit on it. I misspelled after. A note that's neither sharp nor flat is said to be this. Silent, but deadly. Jessica Tandy won a Tony for this role in a streetcar named Desire. Donald the Duck! A nonette is a composition for this many musical instruments or voices. No, I don't speak Italian. I told you! Platinum Edition is the exact same game as the original, just now with new questions, just like Jeopardy Teen Tournament on Game Boy, released the same year as Platinum Edition. This was their bread and butter, coming up with trivia. I mean, the categories in this round of Jeopardy are immaculate. What should I choose? State capitals for 100 or state capitals for 100? But by 1997, it was about time for the company to head back to their strategy game roots with the title Conquest Earth First Encounter for PC. Published by Eidos. Damn, this may be their first big original release not based on any prior work that launched outside of the UK. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Damn it, go back, go back. I don't know what sounds the same. Conquest Earth seems to be Data Design's biggest effort yet with all these animated and live action cutscenes. But much like Rise of the Robots, it feels like they did everything but make a damn game. This is a real time strategy game. Without the strategy, and in fact, the thing that requires the most strategy is navigating the interface. But when we get into the game itself, it's just mindless. You just move your units one toe at a time and kill each enemy. That's it. It's like making a platformer where most of the levels are just straight shots with enemies. It makes sense then when there's a hole in level 45, you go, holy sh**. Conquest Earth was a huge disappointment for many. I mean, Eidos was a well-known publisher. This game got actual press. It wasn't like many of Data Design's other titles, which pretty much just flew under the radar. This was their big chance to make a name for themselves. The eyes were on this game at the time, and they blew it. But, as we can see, that doesn't really matter in the video game industry. Data Design achieved the license to one of the most beloved properties of all time. Not the Raiders! Lego Rock Raiders on PC. Another 
goddamn strategy game. But what the hell was their problem? Man, you're not good at making sandwiches. But all I own is bread! However, despite how their previous strategy games came out, LEGO Rock Raiders is generally well-liked and still has a fairly active fan community. It's not the mind-blowing, but it's one of those games you can tell that if you played it as a kid, you'd probably look back at it finally today. Of course, that means if you have no nostalgia link to it and try playing it right now, you're not necessarily gonna be won over. But you can at least clearly see a decent enough PC game for kids here. So yeah, this one ain't half bad. So ain't half bad, it received a PlayStation release, also developed by Data Design. Well, if the PC version wasn't half bad, this is well over 60%. What the hell happened here? This is a completely different game, and while Rock Raiders on PC was okay, this this is genuinely abysmal. This is a top-down game where you just walk around and collect all the green crystals in these unbelievably dark levels with nothing of note in them. It's just walk around and find all the things. This, this is horrible. I know what you mean. My father is dead. I guess word got out, Data Design could take your beloved kid's toy license and give you something to bitch about at Thanksgiving. Because shortly after LEGO, Data Design took a stab at Tonka with Tonka Space Station on PC and PlayStation. Can arrest them. Why have so many companies entrusted these guys with their brands? Kids' brands, no less. Have you seen what they do in their spare time? Dude. This game is notorious for making no damn sense, at least to every person in the world ever. There's no explanations, no tutorials. It's up to you to figure out how Tonka made it to space. Fortunately, the amount of time you have to spend figuring the controls and objectives out makes up for the lack of content in the game. Stretches a 30 minute game to about five or six hours. That's good. Well, this game is bad, and there's still a certain level of quality it adheres to. It's something that doesn't look out of the ordinary for a children's PC game from the early 2000s, which unfortunately leads this game to be pretty easily forgotten. Which is really bad when you're trying to find something to play. <laughs> this looks fun. So, if these are bad, unmemorable games, something has to change. Oh, I was just gonna try a different shirt. This was the era of data design shift in focus from bad video games to the Antichrist. Yeah, around the same time as Tonka Space Station, there was two other data design releases, Tonka Monster Trucks and Gubble Buggy Racer on PC. Yeah, well, this spits in the face of my belief system. They can't drive. Tonka Space Station got a PS1 release, Conquest Earth, and especially LEGO Rock Raiders on PC are well known and popular enough to figure out how to run them on modern hardware. Gubble Buggy Racer, I'm not even positive exists. Like this shouldn't be that hard to figure out. It's Gubble Buggy Racer, not God. Doesn't mean you can't find downloads for it online, and I got pretty damn close to running this thing. I deserve a medal. <laughs> I guess all I can do is gawk at gameplay online. Uh, Scott's opinion is, do three dots count? Tonka Monster Trucks is far easier to find a physical copy of, but that doesn't mean anything when it comes to running it on a modern PC. A similar issue to Gubble Buggy Racer, but like what I said about Tonka Space Station, while these games may all be of a lower quality, you can still see a bit of effort here. It's like, my god, you included the color yellow? But once Data Design entered the sixth generation of gaming, Everything changed with the release of Nickelodeon Party Blast. Oh my god, Data Design's making bad games now? It's a crossover between all your favorite Nickelodeon characters like Cat from Cat Dog and Dog from Cat Dog. There's five mini games to play here. Five, one, two, three, four, five. It is very useful. I only have to use one hand to describe this game. Cause the other one is busy. Okay, so I think a one out of 10 is a bit harsh for this game. A two, maybe? I think as a Nickelodeon product, th there's enough here for a child to think they like it. Some voice acting, enough references to the source material. It's not incredible in these regards, but it does enough to ensure children will just convince themselves this is good. Look, it's Jimmy Neutron. Oh, I knew it was missing something. But outside of the license, this game has about 20 minutes of content overall, with such a small amount of mini games that all play and control abysmally. It's not unplayable but why does that matter? Why would you want to play it? Nickelodeon Party Blast feels designed around the concept of kids stupid. They don't know any better, they'll play anything with a smile in it, and they'll do it over and over and over again. The children will replay the same movie 4,000 times, so why put more than five minigames in the title? They won't notice, their brains don't fully grow until they're 25. And I just realized this game kind of sucks. This design philosophy is what carried data design through the next 10 years. 
It's a pretty rock solid plan. I mean, I don't want shit, so don't give it to me. And thus, data design stopped giving a shit. Five games in 2004, all original IPs on the PlayStation 2. And the first one is Myth Makers Orbs of Doom. Are you sure it's not lie pumpers? Circles are bad? Yeah, orbs just don't really do it for me. Now, spheres, though? Why do I have to respond to that? Yeah, just so lie pumper circles are bad, you may be looking at like, oh, this is D tier monkey ball. I'd say it's more like A tier Denny's. This is a part of Data Design's new series, Myth Makers. Every Walt Disney needs their Mickey Mouse. Every Vlad the Impaler needs something fed up. So I guess the basis here is that the Myth Makers are child looking creatures. Uh, children, if you will. Dressed up as fictional, mythical icons. You have Trixie as the Easter Bunny, uh, Nick as Santa Claus, why stop there? Where is he? I guess this guy is our main villain, but that's just profiling. I don't think he appears in the actual game because this thing has no cutscenes, no story, no nothing. It's all about reading between the lines with this one. Oh, it's just a very simple, bland, and lifeless super monkey ball clone with some of the most uninteresting level designs you could ask for. Why would you ask for that? The game's beatable in under an hour, and even when you do, nothing happens. They just kick you back to the title screen. I mean, I would at least want an apology. However, disregarding how bad of a game this is, well, when you do that, it's not that bad. It functions, and thankfully, to rectify that, Data Design released a Wii version three years later. All right, so it's Orbs of Doom with a tweaked menu screen and forced motion control. Uh, how do I describe these? Like, you ever tried tilting a hot dog down? That sh hurts. Yeah, I would have vastly preferred if they had you hold the Wii Remote sideways to tilt it around instead of vertically. But, you know what they say, f this game. But see, this was all a part of Data Design's big strategy. First off, release numerous games on the PlayStation 2 and PC in Europe only. For some reason, Europe had pretty lenient guidelines on what legally qualified as a PlayStation 2 game over there. The Mouse Police. No, they don't make cuffs that small! Some incredibly low quality releases on the platform occurred only in Europe, many of which were published by a company known as Phoenix Games, who happened to work with Data Design to publish many of their titles too. Then when the Nintendo Wii came out, they saw this as an opportunity not only to bring their games to a new console, but a new market as well. This was how us Ohioans played most of Data Design's games from this era, the Wii version of the European PlayStation 2 version of bad. But some games remained exclusive to Europe and the PlayStation 2 and PC, such as one Habit Trail Hamster Ball. I know you may be asking, what's Habit Trail, Scott? Well, I can answer the first question. Habit Trail is a line of hamster accessories. Yeah, Data Design secured the rights to a hamster ball brand. I didn't know there were rights to secure. The game even has special menus showing tips on proper hamster care, the do's and don'ts of owning a hamster, what to feed them, hamster food good, poison bad. This game's just trying to sell me on damn hamster bleach. Well, Habit Trail Hamster Ball is... Let's move on to another game. All right, next up. Hamster Heroes. Oh, great. Now I have to thank them for their service? I already do. So what do these little critters do that I can't do with a 12 gauge? Nothing. As long as you have that gun, these hamsters are worthless. Hamster Heroes is... Let's move on to another game. Three damn rodent in a ball games? Hell, four if you want to count how Hamster Heroes was reprinted with a different cover. These look like damn mice. Let the war rage on. Now, all these games are pretty damn similar, but they do have differences, you know? Orbs, balls, mice. Hamster Heroes definitely feels better to control than Orbs of Doom, but the level design is way more nonsensical. And then you have Habit Trail, which is just a complete joke with its level design. So yeah, there's a game for everybody. But while each of these games are different, they're really not at the same time. They have the same assets, user interface, features. I mean, it feels like they just drag and drop new art into the loading screens and call it a day. I mean, Hamster Heroes and Habit Trail Hamster Ball are pretty much the exact same thing outside of Habit Trail taking place in a bedroom, heroes in a lab, and the hamsters have got to be bleeding. Well, I'd trade a bleeding hamster for a bloody rat any day. Let's try Myth Maker Super Kart GP, another 2004 European PS2 release that came over here on the Wii in 2007. Finally, the Myth Makers can bitch about gas prices with my dad. It's an extraordinarily basic Mario Kart clone, the one that includes environments from Orbs of Doom, which is world building. It's like seeing something up on the news. It adds a layer. So this is a game 
that works. It's so basic, it would be surprising if it didn't. The controls are a little touchy, but they do the job, though. Why do I have to shake the controller to use an item? I already have to tilt it to steer. That's like rubbing your stomach while patting your head while driving. You do as little as even think about touching anything in the game, and your cart's gonna flip out. You're gonna end up backwards or on your side. The physics are completely messed up up and thankfully the game knows that and resets you back in place if it detects that you spun out but that just leads me to ask what you didn't consider these as cries for help there's barely any content here too they basically have four tracks that are just repeated throughout the rest of the game except now it's nighttime or now you have to do the track backwards yeah yeah that, that's more content uh, much like how sonic colors in europe has more content than the north american release See? Well, maybe Data Design's other kart racing effort is effort. This is Action Girls Racing. Wait a second. This is just Living World Racing again! Yeah, Living World Racing was a European-only PS2 and PC release. And, similar to Habitrail Hamster Ball, it has the endorsement of Rodent Studios. Yeah, I thought Living World was a children's cartoon series or something, like the busy world of Richard Scarry. Dude, they make rat food. But we can pick from some of our favorite living world animals. Mr. Mouse, Mr. Hamster, Mr. Rat, Mr. Guinea Pig, Mr. Chinchilla, Mr. Dwarf Rabbit, Mr. Rabbit, and Mr. Ferret. Now, what can we infer by this character roster? The absolute sausage fest. But also how living world has a vast array of iconic characters. I mean, they are all here on the loading screen. That's Mr. Mouse. So surely, because this is a racing game featuring these characters and they're prominently featured with names, I can look up Mr. Mouse from living world and see all the other wacky adventures Mr. Mouse has gotten himself into. Well, I got news for ya. There is no Mr. Mouse, Mr. Hamster, Mr. Rat, Chinchilla, Guinea Pig, Dwarf, Rabbit, Rabbit, Ferret. The, the only example of these characters being as they are is Living World Racing, a racing game starring your favorite characters from Living World Racing. I thought for as long as I had this game, oh, this must be some kid show in Europe. Not only, no, they make rat betting, but these characters aren't even characters, which for a character named Mr. Rat? I'm fucking shocked! So the only person this game would appeal to, oh, to be a mouse for a day, is that. This one isn't good either. I mean, thankfully with this being only on PS2 and PC, there's no forced motion controls, though it's not like those are unbearable on Wii. They're just really fucking bad. But it's not like any of these are necessarily better or worse. They're just the same damn games. Even the power-ups are basically copy and pasted. If I had to pick one, I'd say Action Girls Racing may be the worst. I mean, the first level, the first damn level is one of the worst designed pieces of fiction I've ever experienced. The first damn thing you do in the course is go through doors that just look like they're part of the background. Then you're expected to make turns like this? This feels like a damn platformer level you shoved go-karts in. Like, judging from Data Design's new strategy, let's check out their platformers to see if this stage originated somewhere. Actually, I just found where it came from. This is Ninja Breadman. It's a cookie. Wait, I've, I've seen that before. Uh, that's Milk's best friend. You know, maybe we shouldn't be paying cookies and milk when we deliver these presents. The bank doesn't take them, I've tried. Yeah, well, the, the tooth fairy gets paid in teeth. We can get paid in like, I don't know, fingernails? Could be the finger fairies? We can't do that, we need a drink too. How about tomato soup? No, we'll stain the snow. Why don't we get $200 a piece? So this is our current project proposal. Now it is! So is Ninja Bread Man just a gingerbread cookie ninja, or is this just a whole ass subgenre? Well, let's see how Data Design does platformers. They don't. What the f Okay, I'm I'm dead. And I'm I'm dead again! Oh my god, why bees? What, they couldn't get the rights to flies? This game feels like chafing. We just collect all the keys to unlock the portal at the end and move on to the next stage. Repeat that six times and you're not playing Ninja Bread Man because there's only four levels. Wow, this game is so bad. It only has four levels. Did you want more? While the Wii game only tells you to jump with the nunchuck, you can jump with the Z button, which is the most concrete evidence I've seen so far that God exists. For some reason, Data Design forced motion control into all of their Wii ports, which I never understood that's more work because without motion control this game plays perfectly fine on the playstation 2 to find plays candyland is under attack you're just asking to be sued pick a more original name will you oh no scrabble is under attack hordes of snapping cupcakes see i just don't get that shit. why are they attacking me i'm one of them throw ninja stars to stun enemies and follow up with the mighty samurai sword reducing enemies into a quivering pool of raspberry jam even the bees it's just a completely generic generic 3D platformer, one that gives me 
just by controlling it because Ninja Breadman is so damn fast and using your weapon is so damn slow that every moment in this game just feels like <laughs> ah! It works. It's a game, but it's the bare minimum of what I'd call one. You can beat it in under an hour. Hell, probably 20 minutes if you knew what you were doing. Done! Yeah. <laughs> He's a f***ing cookie, I know. So, Ninja Bread Man, not the best it could be. Similar sentiment I have towards organized crime. I'd definitely rather play it than Data Design's kart racing efforts. Most of those are just incredibly boring. Ninja Bread Man's got that and bees. Next in line of Data Design's Wii era platformers is this. Anubis 2? They made a second new Bis? Oh, I love the first one. It had graphics, graphics, graphics. Graphics? graphics? The only graph I'm saying ick to is this one. Graphics. There's no Anubis 1? There's no Anubis 1 graphics. on any screen I'm aware of, and graphics. that includes a screen on my back door. And I ain't talking about my ass. Why are you whispering that to me? Anubis 2 is actually supposed to be pronounced Anubis the Second, as if this is the offspring of the original Egyptian god Anubis. Okay, that's fine, but just call the game Anubis Jr. There will never be another incarnation of the Egyptian god Anubis. Wait! And drum roll, please. Damn, all we could get was a rim shot. Of course it's the same goddamn thing as Ninja Bread Man. I mean, even if there isn't an actual Anubis 1, there is. Anubis 2 actually does switch things up though, featuring more levels, longer levels. <laughs> Cause that was Ninja Bread Man's problem. There wasn't enough of it. While there are enough changes between most of Data Design's work here to classify these as different games, I mean, I may be playing data design games right now, but I ain't stupid. I've just run out of options to gain a personality. These are the same damn things, evident by one rock and roll adventures. Yup. I always thought Ninja Bread Man was oddly Elvis shaped. Then we have the third in the Myth Maker series, Myth Maker's Trixie in Toyland. Before we see what it is, uh, let's go over what it might be. Wrong. Bad. It's strange how the platformer was the third Myth Makers game while the monkey ball clone and kart racer came before it. But hey, you know, leave it to data design to break conventions. For example, most people say you shouldn't eat piss. Hey, you drink it. Myth Makers is just like Ninja Bread Man, which is just like Anubis 2, which is just like Rock and Roll Adventures. It's like Elvis with ears. And that's Data Design's lineup of 3D platformers for the PS2, PC, and Wii, which pales in comparison to all the damn racing games. Listen, there's nothing to say about these games. Monster Trucks Arenas. Have any of you ever played this game? God, no. This game involves my three biggest fears. Monsters, trucks, in the Monster Trucks Arena video game. My three biggest fears are men, bread, and losing my brother in a homicide. I know how you feel. I got a gluten allergy. The Monster Trucks games are just the same as the car racers, but with big ass cars. Rig Racer 2 is the same as the Monster Trucks games, but with trucks. Now where's Rig Racer 1? I don't know. Maybe it's the same as Anubis the second, and it's pronounced Rig Racer the second. Goodyear Racing, Classic British Motor Racing, Urban Extreme Street Rage, and all the damn Kawasaki games. The snowmobiles, quad bikes, jet ski. Yeah, Data Design got the license to make a jet ski game with the Kawasaki brand. The same license Nintendo got for their jet ski game, Wave Race 64. So in a weird way, Data Design created a spiritual successor to Wave Race 64. It's obvious why Data Design pumped out so many racing games. I mean, they're obviously fairly easy to iterate on. You can make a Monster Trucks game and a Truck Trucks game, swap the cars and environments, and for some reason, these two feel more distinct than Ninja Bread Man and Anubis 2. But outside of these examples, they did some more experimental racing games, like London Taxi, Rush Hour. This is a clone of the Crazy Taxi series, which is a bit less egregious than Billy the Wizard Rocket Broomstick Racing, which is a clone of, uh, uh, little wizards. Oh. My. God. Moving on. Earache Extreme Metal Racing, based on the record label Earache. That's just great. Yeah, next up, Crash Easter Egg Hunt. Mini Desktop Racing. These are all horrible, okay? B Billy and Desktop have the worst feeling controls of the bunch. Lud and Taxi is probably the most tolerable. And then earache, it, it's just badass. Much like misspelling kids while playing sports. It's the kids sports series. Here's basketball. And ice hockey. And international football. You know, in Europe on the PS2, this was called City Soccer Challenge. Soccer, 
in Europe. You're in Europe. Why are you calling it the American term? You don't call crumpets cheese nips over there. The kids sports series is about as bland as it gets. But I will admit for what they are, they do the job, unlike the kids' sports series. This almost looks like it's from an entirely different franchise. Kids' sports, crazy mini golf, featuring new U technology, allowing anybody to put themselves in the game. Wait, wait what? Wait, wait, Rex, what are you doing? Oh, I just decided to tinker. Tinker? Yeah, it's tink brought to the next level. A chicken man. It... It doesn't work. This game doesn't work. I have no idea how anybody can control this. Like, what the hell am I doing wrong? I'm not playing Crazy Mini Golf 2, obviously. And I'm still wrong. Now, Data Design put out Junior League Sports later on, which is pretty much an updated compilation of kids sports basketball, ice hockey, and soccer all on one disc. It'd be even nicer if they included more of their games here, like uh, Party Pigs Farmyard Games. It's just a bunch of hogs competing in the Olympics, but, but it's on a farm. Oh, oh, that's what the title meant. I have to admit, though, this was a later data design release. No PS2 or PC version. This launched fully for the Wii in 2009, and, I mean, it's not good, but it's its own game. It's not reusing loads of assets like previous Wii efforts. This is an original data design release. We haven't gotten one of those in years. Why stop there? How about Battle Rage the Robot Wars? This has no obvious data design attributes outside of the fact it's poorly designed and controlled and the game as a whole rips ass, but still. My personal golf trainer on Wii is a completely different beast from the Crazy Mini Golf series and intends on teaching you how to properly play golf rather than whatever the hell that series was doing to my brain. This is pretty much just a series of videos with some interactive segments here and there. Best damn thing they've done. Well, this means things are looking up. What I said still applies. <sighs> Okay, what's left? Uh, well, some licensed kids games exclusive to Europe on the PlayStation 2, An American Tale, Casper and the Ghostly Trio, and Casper's Scare School. What do these all have in common? Yeah, they all fucking stink. An American Tale is a very sloppy, basic, and simple minigame collection disguised as a level-based story mode, and is pretty much a data design sampler platter. First couple stages are monkey ball clones, followed by some platformer stages, and it'll take you roughly 35 minutes to get through this, 30 if we shave off the time I spent on the title screen. Casper and the Ghostly Trio and Casper's Scare School are both cut from the same cloth, both incredibly basic and generic platformers. Uh, better than Ninja Breadman, uh, worse than Forced Extinction of Species. There, all data design games tested. If we're quick, we can catch up to Santa. It's only 2 a.m. on April 16th. Oh man, I had work a month ago. I can't believe we missed the deadline for Christmas Eve! We wasted four months playing these games? Well, I wouldn't say wasted. Probably just say misused. Yeah! I enjoyed not talking about my ass for four months. Yeah, I enjoyed not hearing about it. Yeah, it says right here. I'm pretty cool. And by proxy, so are all you. I mean, yeah, actually. Looking back at it all, it doesn't really feel like a waste of my time because I spent it with all of you. That's it! We do have the competitive edge! Santa may be able to give all these physical gifts, but we don't need that! We have our time and company and friendship! We have the experience of going through all these horrible games together that'll last us throughout our entire lives! It's way more valuable than something you can unwrap. These games as gifts are absolute garbage, but the memories we made spending time with each other going through them, that's priceless. And that can be what sets us apart. We won't give away presents, we'll give away our time and energy. Come on guys, it's a beautiful snowy April night in Ohio. Let's go caroling! Ah! Well, that's how I spent my 114 days of Christmas and I don't regret it. Data Design Interactive is the worst game developer of all time. There's no getting around that. But that doesn't mean they never tried. Going through their history, it's honestly really sad to see a studio just trying to get by doing what they could. Uh, picking up porting jobs, making all different types of games, just trying to see what sticks. And in the end, what ended up working for them was oversaturating the market with constant, 
garbage budget releases that were all clones of each other. It felt like they were saying, we give up, we know we're bad, let's not even try anymore. But while that may have worked for a couple years, it obviously wasn't sustainable. It just goes to show that you can try to game the system, put as little effort into your work as possible, and it may work initially, but it's gonna catch up to you at some point. However, while what they did wasn't noble, they still created some of the most memorable gaming experiences for me of all time, even if they were all horrible. Uh, just going from Ninja Breadman to Anubis 2, from Action Girls Racing to Myth Maker Supercart GP, and just seeing the same damn game, that sticks with you. It's good that they're gone, but man, they gave me one of my best Christmas memories of all time. And I just wish I could give them as merry of a Christmas as they gave to me. I wish they were back making games again today, just for a little bit. And near the end of their life, they were actually trying a bunch of new things. I want to see how much their projects would have evolved these days. I just wish I could tell them, Merry Christmas Day to design. Junior League Sports on Nintendo Switch? Crazy Mini Golf on Nintendo Switch? Never mind, never mind, never mind, never mind, never mind, never mind.